Hi, this is Robert Sanjanis. How are you today? I'm coming to you again in our program, the Open Question Program, set aside for you to ask questions, make comments on anything regarding the church, the Bible, religion, um, topics related to that, anything that's on your mind uh, regarding uh, religion in general. Um, I set aside this program for an hour uh, from 7 Eastern Standard Time to 8 o'clock every Tuesday and Wednesday. So if you have any questions, something has been on your mind that you want to talk about, feel free to chime in and type out your answer and I will endeavor to answer your question as best as I am able. Uh, today is September the 17th, uh, halfway through the month of September, and I hope it's been an enjoyable one for you. Uh, the weather is nice here on the East Coast in Pennsylvania, and um, one of the, my favorite times of the year in autumn. So, at any rate, um, we have some questions that I've been wanting to get to. Uh, from a few sessions ago. Let me see if I still have those here. Oh boy, now what did I do with them? I thought I had them here. Anyway, as I shuffle through these, um, uh, wait a minute here. Okay, so here are some questions that I had from uh, that I didn't get to. I think maybe two weeks ago or more than that because um, I've been meaning to get to these and I keep forgetting to do so okay so um, Gage uh, had a question last time and it said Calvinists use the verse in 1st Peter that says they stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to, to support their notion of double predestination, since they were destined to disobey. How would you respond? Um, well, the way I would respond, Gage, is that nobody is ever destined to disobey God. <laughs> okay, I mean, you have, you have to take that as a given. Um, for example, the famous passage that Calvin used in Romans chapter 9, uh, you know, where it talks about the potter and the clay, uh, you know, the whole discussion there. Now, I have to admit, you know, uh, it, in a surface reading of that passage, you would uh, come away with perhaps what Calvin understood it to be. But, see, the Bible's written in a very tricky way sometimes. Um, not to say that God is trying to deceive us, but um, uh, it's Paul's mind is like in, in a, a dozen different directions sometimes when he is writing a passage. He's got all these thoughts in his head, and he's trying to crystallize them into a passage, say a chapter. And in the process, um, it looks like he's saying one thing when he could be saying something totally opposite, okay? Now, just to reinforce this, let me get the passage in Romans 9, and then maybe we'll, we'll go to First Peter. And um, Romans 9, I think most people are familiar with this passage. Where Paul says, for example, in verses um, 10 to 13, it says, Not only that, but Rebekah's children had one and the same father, our father Isaac. Yet before the twins were born or had done anything good or bad, in order that God's purpose and election might stand, not by works, but by him who calls, she was told the older will serve the younger, just as it is written. Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. Okay, so many will take this passage and they will conclude that 
God hated Esau and therefore predestined him to be evil, and thus he was predestined to damnation. Okay? But if you'll notice in reading the passage, all right, no, so we'll, we'll admit that, you know, it may look that way. It may look like it could go in that direction, okay? But the passage doesn't say anything about salvation at all, okay? Paul is just basically trying to make an argument uh, f uh, to the Jews about works. And so if they don't like the first example he gives, which he's all ready for, because he's like Thomas Aquinas, you know, he... He, he knows your arguments better than you know your own arguments. And he'll actually put your arguments into his text, and then he'll answer them, which is what basically what he does here. So he, he basically says, if you didn't like the first argument I gave against your works, because the Jews were doing works to be saved. Um, now, and these are not Catholic works, okay? These are works of debt, as we would normally uh, categorize them. These are works in which they, they worked, and they wanted God to pay them with, you know, blessing or salvation. And they could care less about God, but, but, they, but they wanted to do the works to get paid, basically. So it's like having a job, uh, hating the job, you hate the boss, you hate the company, but you're just working to get paid, okay? That's what the Jews were doing. They didn't like God. They didn't like the whole system. Uh, you know, they, they wish they could be elsewhere, but they wanted to be paid for their works as if God owed them something. But God doesn't owe anybody anything. Anything that we receive from God is by grace. It's by his benevolence or his promise, okay, not because he owes us anything. And so Paul's arguing with the Jews about this, uh, the fact that the reason they were rejected by God is because, you know, they basically didn't care about God. Uh, they just wanted their pay and wanted to go home and do whatever they wanted to do, okay, to, be, to get right down crude about it. Uh, that's, that's what was going on. And so Paul brings this argument uh, to them and says, yeah, and, and you can't even argue uh, about children in the womb. Okay, because before they were uh, able to do any good or bad, any good or bad works, God chose Jacob over Esau. Okay, and he says, and the elder shall serve the younger. All right, so this is God's prerogative. All right, it doesn't say that Esau was damned. It just says, basically, that Esau, who was supposed to receive the inheritance from his father, uh, did not. Isaac did not receive it from Isaac. Now, there's a, another little story there because Jacob and Rebekah had deceived uh, Isaac into giving the blessing to Esau. But God used that so to deny Esau the blessing. Okay, so uh, uh, that's all the passage is talking about. It's only talking about the fact that God wanted Jacob to be the uh, progenitor of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He didn't want it to be Abraham, Isaac, and Esau, and it had has nothing to do with Esau's salvation. He could have been saved. He just wasn't going to be the patriarch, okay? And that's God's choice. So that's all there is to it. Now, other people would come in here and say, well, that means, you know, that God predestined Esau to damnation. No, there's not a word said about salvation or damnation in this passage, okay? And then I think we, we cover the other uh, passage a couple of weeks ago where Paul is talking about um, Pharaoh. And let me read that passage to you then, because Paul says, what shall we say then? Is God unjust? Not at all. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy, mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. It does not therefore depend on man's desire or effort, but on God's mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, I raised you up for this very purpose, that I might display my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Therefore, God has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy, and he hardens whom he wants to harden. Okay? So, again, here's another argument uh, that somebody could basically take out of context and conclude that, 
you know, Esau, or I'm sorry, um, uh, Pharaoh was uh, destined by God, predestined, if, you, if we can enforce it by using the, the prefix, to act a certain way. All right. And, but what did we see when we went back into the passages in Exodus that talk about this very thing that Paul is quoting from? Okay. Uh, so, we, in other words, we are required to go back and look at the context of the Old Testament in Exodus specifically to try to understand what Paul is saying here. Okay. So, <clears throat> What we saw back then in Exodus chapter 9, verse 34, was that uh, Pharaoh was the one who initiated the hardening of his heart. Okay? And the first says in verse 34 that Pharaoh hardened his heart. Doesn't say God did it. Okay? So, and that's because Pharaoh has a free will. God's never going to take that away from mankind. Everything basically hinges on man's free will. That's why we have to wait so long uh, for this whole uh, uh, era to end. It's because of man's free will. It's that important. And God will never deny man a free will. Uh, so it's Pharaoh's free will that makes the decision. And then God comes in and says, after that, then I harden Pharaoh's heart. Well, you know, if you stick your foot in the mud, you know, you may have the other foot stuck in the mud too. And it may be by natural consequence. And basically that's what God is saying here. He hardened his heart, stuck his foot in the mud. I just sort of you know, moved the other foot into the mud as well. And, and uh, there it stood. Okay. So it's uh, two actions that are involved here. Okay. And again, this has nothing to do with whether the, the person is damned or saved. It's just talking about, how God deals with people. So what we can take from this is not Calvin's predestination. What we take from this is the fact that, as our Catholic Catechism says in paragraph 600, one of the best statements ever made about how predestination and free will fit together. And it says, since God knows all moments of time in their immediacy, he gives man uh, he, he, he plans his predestination in accord with man's free response, okay? Now, the catechism isn't saying that it, can, it has it all figured out as, as to how man has a free will and God predestines. It doesn't go there, okay? That's a, that's a rabbit trail. And unless, you ha unless you're prepared, uh, you, you better stay on the surface, but at least the catechism says that there are two components to this, okay? And that's always been the glory of the Catholic Church, is that they've been able to see the tension of two sides of the argument and never denounce one side or the other and make some kind of balance, even if it's a literary balance, as we have here in the, in the catechism, uh, not a theological one that these two components are alive and well, and both must fit into the formula, you see. As opposed to, you know, Martin Luther and John Calvin, <clears throat> excuse me, who decided to go on one way, and that is the predestination way, and forget all about free will. Ignore it, deny it, uh, take all the verses in the Bible that talked about it, and basically, exegete them away. You know, one of the famous passages on the other side of the issue is 1 Timothy 2, verse 4, where it says, God desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Okay, now the word all there is the Greek word panta, which means all. Okay, so God desires all men, not some men, that God desires all men to be saved. Okay, now, if you're an honest exegete, you have to take that passage as it stands. You cannot say, well, I don't like that, you know, because my theology says that it can't happen. You see, you can't do that with the Bible. And that's why 
we have so many Protestant denominations because that's exactly what they do. They'll reach a passage that doesn't agree with their theology, and they'll find some way to get around it. And so what they do is they'll say, God desires all kinds of men to be saved. Okay? Now, <laughs> if Paul wanted to write kinds, uh, hetero in the Greek, he would have put it there. Okay? Uh, it's very easy to do that. And uh, it would be certainly a lot less confusing and a lot more direct if he had done that, if that's what he meant. But apparently that's not what he meant. Otherwise, he would have put the word in there. Okay? So um, you can't do that with Scripture. You have to take it at face value. All right? So uh, that's, you know, an important thing we need to know uh, whenever we exegete the passage. Now, the particular passage in 1 Peter, um, I'm not, for some reason, it's not coming to my memory which passage that is. So, Gage, if you're engaged here, uh, write, write in to me and tell me exactly what passage that is, and I'll come right back to it. Okay, so um, let's see. Adam says here, um, greetings, Dr. Sengenis. I have two questions. What is your opinion on the Seti Vacantis Diamond Brothers? And it says, see more. I'll click it. And the next question is, is natural family planning moral? and acceptable for Catholics. Peter Diamond argues that it is not because it essentially becomes a form of contraception. Okay, well, thank you for those, those questions, Adam. Uh, my opinion of the, uh, on the Sede Vacantis Diamond Brothers, uh, well, you hit the operative word there, which is Sede Vacantis, okay? Um, so let me just say, um, I appreciate the Diamond Brothers for all their research into uh, the popes that we've had for the last, what, 50 years or so, um, or maybe in the 20th century, okay? Uh, they've done a lot of work there, and, um, you know, a lot of that stuff is factual, okay? So uh, they're, they're good there. They're good researchers, okay? If you ever, if, you know, you have to be careful Okay, not everything they say is uh, factual, but by and large, you know, a lot of their stuff is factual, and so we have to pay attention to it. You can't just, you know, stick your head in the sand and pretend it's not there. All right, um, it's not so much the facts that they bring, it's the conclusions of those facts, and that is concluding that they can't be a pope. Well, essentially, then they become the popes. They become the judges of the popes. And the, our canon law uh, says that the pope cannot be judged by anyone, okay, uh, in the sense of a legal uh, judgment. It's not saying that he can't be judged as if, you know, we can't say whether the pope's doing a good job or not, or whether he missed this one or he missed that one or thing. We can always have those opinions about the pope, and we can bring it to his attention as we have done in the last uh, year or so. Our Pope Francis has been bombarded with people uh, who, according to Canon Law 212, have the right to bring to their pastor, whether it's their local pastor or chief pastor, concerns about whether he is seeing things rightly or wrongly and all that. So that's always the possibility. But judging the Pope uh, in a legal canonical judgment saying that uh, because he is wrong, then he is no longer the Pope. Uh, you know, that's not for us to say. We have no authority to say that. Well, let me take that back. You can say it all you want, but it's not going to mean anything. Uh, it's because you have no authority, okay? And that's just the way the Catholic Church works. That's why we have a hierarchy. We have a hierarchy to protect the hierarchy, basically. Because if, if we paid attention and took to heart every Tom, Dick, and Harry that had an accusation against the Pope or a bishop or a cardinal or whatever, we'd be bogged down forever in trying to adjudicate these matters, okay? Um, I'm not saying that people's accusations are wrong. I'm just saying that we have a hierarchy to take care of those things 
they have to sort out those things. And, you know, they do the best they can with what they have available. And sometimes that always doesn't work best, but it's better than chaos, okay? If you don't have a hierarchy, then you have chaos. And those are your two choices, okay? A hierarchy that may not function properly all the time or chaos, take your pick, okay? Because that's what it'll eventually lead to. So, you know, my, my view of this, of the Diamond Brothers is, you know, some good, some bad, okay? As you probably would expect, okay? So, um, is natural fam family planning moral and acceptable for Catholics? Well, you know, it all depends on what you mean by natural family planning. I think that's what the problem is that has come about since Humanae Vitae. Uh, the uh, Costa Canubi, written by uh, Pope, Paul, or Pope Pius XI in 1938, was it? That was crystal clear that there is to be no contraception, okay? So we already had the information. Uh, it was just a matter of whether the church was going to reiterate it uh, again in another encyclical, Humanae Vitae, and that was because the decision was made to reiterate it in this second encyclical because at that time in the 1960s, the pill became popular. First time in human history that you could pop a pill in your mouth and either prevent pregnancy or terminate the pregnancy, depending on which pill you took. Okay, uh, like RU486, you know, that's a pill also, or it, it, it can be taken internally. And um, what that does is it kills the, uh, fe the fetus or the, uh, the blastula as they call it, you know, barely a week old uh, before it can uh, hook itself up to the uterus and, you know, be viable. So this, is, this was the first time that humankind could basically walk to the store, buy something off the shelf, and terminate a pregnancy. So it became much more important than it was back in, you know, 1930s, all right, uh, when Costi Canubi was written. Uh, so um, what that tells us is, what was the church going to do? Well, you know, whether you liked Paul VI or not, okay, the fact that he held the office of the papacy meant that he was going to make the right decision. That's the glory of the Catholic Church. It doesn't matter who's in office. Uh, you know, Pius the, the 11th, Pope Paul the 6th, or Joe Schmo the 1st, okay? If they are a duly uh, recognized pope sitting in the, in the papal chair and assuming the papal office, they will make the right decision. That's guaranteed by the Holy Spirit. If that's not true, then we don't have a Catholic Church, okay? We just have another organization that has best guesses and estimates, but it has no solid truth. That's not the Church of Jesus Christ, okay? The Church of Jesus Christ knows the truth and proclaims the truth, no matter who's sitting in the chair, okay? So you can always depend upon that. Now, of course, if you have a non, if you have an anti-pope in the chair, then he's not guaranteed that uh, papal prerogative. Okay, and we've had a few anti-popes in our history, starting about in the 1100s, and we've had like eight of them. Okay, and some of them have reigned for you know years. All right, so it is possible. Okay, but that's not for us to figure out. Going back to the Diamond Brothers again. Okay. We can, we can give our opinions to the hierarchy and they can, you know, adjudicate it as they see fit, which was done, in fact, when the other anti-popes got into the papal chair, okay? It was adjudicated by those in charge, by the hierarchy themselves, and that's what we would expect, okay? So, um, but at any rate, going back to um, uh, artificial birth control, that's what Humanae Vitae, 
was running against artificial birth control, namely the pill. That's artificial, okay? Why is it artificial? That's a term that they use to, des to designate something that is not natural, okay? Uh, and what is natural then? That just brings up the question, what is natural? Well, what is natural is that there's a certain cycle that the woman has. She may ovulate uh, for two, three days at the most out of the month, out of 30 days. Okay, so, uh, you know, that's pretty slim considering. Uh, three days, okay, uh, I think the, uh, the egg is, you know, only available for like a day after it's uh, in the fallopian tube. So, uh, you know, things have to happen pretty quick. And um, so, but that's natural. That's the natural rhythm. Okay. And so, you know, mankind, now that he knows, he can, you know, put a microscope in the uterus and he can see what's going on now. Whereas, you know, you could never do that before. Okay. Uh, now we have to make a division between artificial and natural contraception. Okay, now contraception basically is something that begins in the mind. That's one thing we need to make clear. Okay, what I would call a contraceptive mentality. All right, and in that sense, it might not make a di big difference between whether it's artificial or natural if you have a contraceptive mentality. And that mentality is that you are going to control how many children you have, okay? Though you do play a part in how many children you have, okay? Because you can decide, you know, uh, you know, I, I don't have to have uh, in, uh, sexual relations for, you know, except uh, once every six months, okay? So the odds of you conceiving then are pretty slim, okay? What Humana Vitae was trying to say was that unless there are grave circumstances, you can't think that way. And I think it was right on in that sense. Grave circumstances. Now, the problem is, how do you define grave circumstances? Now, it tried to do somewhat of a definition, but it wasn't specific enough. Okay? If, if you're going to lay down a law that says, only under grave circumstances can you use the natural methods to inhibit a pregnancy. That is, you're, you're not having sexual relations on those three days, possibly four, that uh, the woman is fertile. Okay. Um, what are those grave reasons? Okay. Now, being poor may be one of them. Being mentally unstable is another one. Uh, you know, if a woman's a diabetic, you know, it's gonna, she's going to have a hard time. Those things all have to be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. But, you see, if you have a, a, a contraceptive mentality, that means not only are you going to try to give excuses, those excuses are not going to be just financial excuses or medical excuses, they're going to be just, I don't want children excuses. That's wrong. That's dead wrong. Okay. That's a contraceptive mentality. That's a mentality that says we are in control. We are going to decide that we're only going to have two or three children and that's it. That's wrong. And unfortunately, a lot of modern Catholics today are using the grave reasons that were put in a Humanae Vitae as defined by themselves, and even many priests are, are like this too. They will give the most lenient definition of if somebody even knows what Humanae Vitae says, you know, if they even care what it says, they'll give the most lenient uh, definition of what grave reasons are. And, and sooner or later, you know, as the decades go by, 
it becomes more and more lenient, more and more lenient until basically it's now natural family planning. Okay. They, you put a name on it and that, that characterizes what kind of practice it is natural. It's not, it's not anymore. Uh, we will, we can inhibit a pregnancy for grave reasons. It's natural family planning as if this is something natural that we can do. We can thwart the pregnancy that God has uh, designed for us uh, and the human race and decide how many we're going to have. Okay. So that's wrong. That's wrong. And I would venture to say that that mentality is mortal. That's a mortal sin. And uh, now, unfortunately, people are being taught that. So they may not be as responsible. But still, the fact is the whole thing is of the devil. Okay. Uh, you know, basically, we're only here for a short time. Very short. Uh, the average person is here, what, 70, 80 years? Okay. The average woman is able to get pregnant from what? possibly 13 years old to um, 40, 45. You could stretch that just a little bit more, possibly. But the prime years are like between 20 and 35. And before and after that, the likelihood is not very great, especially after 35. Okay, so that even makes the, the time structure that much shorter. Okay, you only have a few years. To, to have children and at the safest uh, and optimal level, you, you uh, want a, a young mother who's healthy and can bear children and, you know, and, and limit the opportunity for diseases and, and things like that in being young. Not to say that older women, you know, are prone to have d disease children. I'm just saying that the statistics show that younger women are much better and uh, statistically able to give healthy children, to bear healthy children. Okay, so again, the point is you, your time is so short. So if you're, you know, sp you know, what they call spacing them out, you know, every four or five years, unless you have a great reason for doing that, you're going down the wrong path. And basically what you're doing is you're thwarting the kingdom of God, thwarting the kingdom of God. Because as you only have a little time, God only has a little time, basically. Because he's created you to produce a kingdom for him. The eternal kingdom. And we only got one chance to do it. One. And if we don't do it correctly, then for all eternity, we've missed the opportunity. Okay? So think of it that way. We are in this together with God. We are building the kingdom of God with him. We are not in competition with him. If we find ourselves in competition, then we're, all, we're in the wrong kingdom. Okay? God wants children. God loves children. And he wants to have as many as possible before this world ends to make his kingdom, his eternal kingdom. Because we only have one chance. You know, and I, I, I hate to see this, but... I've seen women who are in their 50s, you know, sometimes 40s, who have had their careers. And, you know, they think that now that they've been liberated, they can have a career. And basically the responsibility of having children is not as pressing as it was before because they have other responsibilities. Okay, so you can see what this liberated, women's liberated mentality has done. And that basically leads to a contraceptive mentality. Because if you are a woman and you join the workforce, well, basically, you have become like a man. Okay, and many of these women even, you know, dress like men. They wear their hair like men. They talk like men. And they act like men, okay? Uh, the, the feminine role has been drastically changed over the past, you know, 100 years or so, ever since Margaret Sanger in the 1920s, okay? 
So now the women are competing with men in the workforce. Not only are they leaving the home and leaving their children to caretakers whom they don't know and, and really can't trust at least a hundred percent to do the best for these children uh, or in, uh, in daycare centers or in schools and you know, whatever. And when mommy comes home at five or six o'clock, she's dead tired because she's been in the workforce. How much time is she going to give to those kids? Okay. Yeah. Here's your supper. And then let's quickly get you off to bed at seven o'clock. And, you know, I'm going to poop out myself in about an hour or two because I have to get up for work the next morning. What kind of family life is that? The kids hardly even know their mothers anymore. Okay. Not only that, but when the women go into the workforce, they take the jobs from the men who should be having them, okay? And these men need these jobs to support their own families, okay? So, I mean, it's bad all the way around for these women. And the, the worst thing is that they develop a contraceptive mentality because if you have a job, let's say that you're a woman and you're climbing the corporate ladder, so to speak, the last thing you want is a baby because not only will your boss look askance at you because, you know, you did it, you committed the sin, the corporate sin, which is having a baby, uh, you know, that kind of thing you have to put up with. Uh, the fact that you are in that kind of environment means you're going to think twice about having children. And that's the, that's the crime right there, where the job becomes more important than the children. And it's almost inevitable that that's going to happen when you're a woman in the workforce, because you either toe the line in the corporate world or you're out of there. They'll find someone else to take your place. And there's plenty of people out there to do it. Plenty of men waiting to take that job. Okay, so this is fierce competition now. You're, you're, this is not just having a job. This is fierce competition. And you better dedicate 100% of your energy and time to this job or else you will pay the price. Okay. Man, having that on your mind as a woman and yet knowing that he, you are married and are to have children, it's, an, it's almost an impossible thing to do. And some women think that they can do both. Well, you may be able to do one halfway and the other halfway, but that's what's going to be a halfway job. You see, there are just so many hours in the day. And the women who choose both have children that grow up that don't even know their mother. I mean, obviously they know who she is. Okay. But when I say no, I'm talking about the Greek, gnosko, which means no deeply, no affectionately, no intimately. Trust in a relationship. You know, I mean, something that takes years and years to build. That's what they're going to have with their nanny, not you. Okay. So that's the, that's the real sin here. Uh, and again, it all comes or leads to a contraceptive mentality, all right? And many husbands out there talk about dropping the ball. These guys don't know, you know, I won't be crude here, but they don't know what it is to be a father and a husband, okay? They have relinquished control of the family to the woman, and that's because they've been taught wrongly that uh, there is supposed to be mutual submission between husband and wife. Mutual submission. Okay? If there was ever a heresy taught in the church, that's one of the biggest ones right there. Because that goes right to the core of the family. And the family is the substance of human society. If you can't get the authority level straight, in the family goodbye to the society okay because that's where it all starts in the family and that's why it's like five times in the new testament saint paul says 
that the woman is to be submissive to the man, submissive to her husband. Five times in five different chapters. And Peter has one of them, 1 Peter chapter 5. Ephesians, Colossians, 1 Corinthians. To almost every church Paul wrote letters to, he said, number one, the wife is to be submissive to her husband. Where do you hear that today? Nowhere. Nowhere. Okay? Because we've all been bamboozled by a liberal doctrine about mutual submission. And this started in the Protestant churches around the 1930s and 40s. And it didn't hit the Catholic Church until about the 1970s and 80s. And then thereafter, it was just natural. Okay? I wrote a book on this called, um, what was it, what's, what's the title, um, Is There Mutual Submission Between Spouses? Get that book. It'll save your marriage. Guaranteed. Okay? Little thin book. I go through all the fathers, I go through all the scriptures, and I go through John Paul II's encyclical, Mulieris Dignitatum. And I shall wear that one off the track. Okay, and I have the right to do that. As a parishioner, I have the right to voice my opinion to show the Pope where he went off the track. And, but that's where most people today in modern Catholicism place their bets. Okay, now, if mutual submission is supposed to be something like, you know, the wife says to the husband, honey, can you take out the trash? Now, what's the husband going to do? Well, I am in authority here, and, uh, you know, you shouldn't be the one telling me what to do. No, that's not what we mean, okay? In the relationship between husband and wife, she can ask him anytime she wants, sweetie, would you take out the trash? As a command, as an indicative statement, whatever she wants, okay? And the honey, and the honey, <laughs> honey will do so, okay? He probably has a honey-do list, and that's one of them. He'll take out the trash, and he better not grumble about it either, okay? Because he does it because he loves his wife, and he wants to preserve the family, okay? So that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about, um, in other words, if, you, if, if someone wants to call that mutual submission, that's, hey, great, you know? And the husband could ask the, the, the wife, you know, can I have dinner at 5 o'clock? She'll submit to them. You know, that's kind of mutual. You take out the trash, I'll cook the dinner. Okay, how's that work out? That's beautiful. Marriages are made of that. Okay? But what we're talking about here is we're talking about the legal position of the father, of the husband. The legal position. He has legal authority over his wife and his children. That is, anything of a legal nature, he is the final authority of the family, not the wife. Okay? He decides what church they're going to go to. He decides what school they're going to go to. They can talk about it, of course, but he makes the final decision. The legal matters of life, the ones that really uh, are when the family is either associating itself outside of the family, or there are internal struggles or conflicts in the family. The husband is the final authority, okay? That's the way it was set up from the beginning, and that's the way it should always be. Anything other than that is of the devil, okay? And it will destroy, it, it eventually will destroy the family as it is happening today. This is why we have 60% of all marriages ending in divorce, okay? Because there's a power struggle going on in the marriage. That's why, okay? This is why we have contraception on a very high level. We can't even reproduce our own population in the United States, okay? They can't do it in Russia. They can't do it in Europe. Why? Because they're all practicing contraception. The only way we can keep our population level up is by 
Immigration. Okay? That's a sad commentary on a nation. When they reach that level, they're headed downhill. It's just a matter of time. Okay? It may be decades, but it's, it's going to happen. If you can't reproduce your population, okay? And then, of course, you have abortion, okay? So if the contraception doesn't work, then, wow, what do you do? Well, of course, there are Catholics who even believe in abortion. They call themselves Catholics, believe it or not. Yeah. So that's the next step for the so-called Christian who's practiced contraception. And see, it's the contraceptive mentality that may push him over the edge to then accept abortion as a final solution. Okay? That's the sad part about it. Okay? So, um, natural family planning? No. Okay? Because that's just a label that tries to make something that was in Humanae Vitae, which was a minimal escape clause into a maximum escape clause, okay? The minimum escape clause was for grave reasons. The maximum is natural family planning, as if you're doing something right by inhibiting the possibility of having children, okay? So you got me on my soapbox on that one, and I have much more to say, but um, let me see. Yeah, I took too much time on that, but I think it had to be said. All right, Clinton says, Hi, Dr. Sengenis. Have you read St. Robert Bellarmine's work against the Protestants de Controversis, and what do you make of them? Um, I struggle to read Latin, uh, Clinton. I mean, I know Latin a little bit, but I uh, haven't read his original work. I do have it. I have the actual book that uh, Robert Bellarmine wrote in in the 1600s believe it or not the actual book it's on my bookshelf <laughs> so i have and i look at it every once in a while but um but i must say the english translation of that um, i've read some of it and the man's brilliant you know he's brilliant the way he argued um i i just am amazed at uh, at his acumen so yeah, I have I've read it uh, certain part. I mean, if there's something in there that you want to discuss, uh, something that he talks about, I'd love to discuss it with you. So bring a passage forward that you want to talk about, and uh, let's let's talk about it. If there's something that troubles you, you know, or you want to congratulate him on a exegetical part, uh, you know, feel free. Okay, so let me see. Go to Jordan here. Uh, what are the best arguments in the church for interpreting Genesis literally? Oh, <laughs> I think you asked this last time, Jordan. So, um, yeah, there there's a lot of arguments. Um, now, I don't know if you want, the last time we covered this, excuse me if there's gnats flying around here again. Um, the last time we covered this, we talked about um, hermeneutical principles. Okay, and as I just reiterate that for a few seconds here, the hermeneutical principle that the church has lived by for its entire existence is literal exegesis of scripture. Okay, and that means, for example, when the church sees a passage like Matthew 26, verse 26, and it says, This is my body, take and eat. Question You got two choices. Do I take that literally or symbolically? Okay, two choices. That's all you have. You know, you have allegorical, metaphorical, anagogical, you know, but basically the literal is set apart from all those other methods because they're all in a way symbolic or spiritual or whatever. Okay, they're not literal. So you're, again, you're back to just two choices. Which one? <coughs> Excuse me which one is the correct way to interpret. Now, this is not just a question about Matthew 26, 26. This is a question about your whole view of the Bible, okay? 
because what applies in Matthew 26, the same principle we use there, is going to apply elsewhere in any other passage that you read. Okay? And even our catechism, uh, the modern catechism, says that the first manner of interpretation of the Bible is literal, the literal. Okay? All interpretations start out with the literal, and they only leave the literal or add to the literal if there's a reason to do so, okay? Because we don't want this to be confusing. We don't want the Bible to be confusing. It's already difficult enough because it's written over 1,500 years by many, many different authors in many, many different contexts and many, many different manners. Uh, so it, that can be difficult itself to sift through all that and get to the kernel of what the, the passage is trying to say. So we don't want to make it any more complicated than it is. So the literal is actually good for us, okay? Because it means we can focus on one meaning that we can get from this text, okay? Now, uh, so that's what we covered the last time, okay? Now, as far as the, the text itself in Genesis, um, I think we dealt with this before, but I'll say it again. And that is the text is put together in such a way where this was the best way to make a universe, if I can say it that way. Okay? Because let's say you're God, and you're, and, well, he doesn't have to figure it out. It just is there, okay? Uh, but let's just say we, um, we extrapolate on that for our human senses, and we say, what's the best way to build a universe? Would it be better to start with a explosion that then spreads out and then cools and then forms bodies, circular bodies, uh, planets, uh, some that don't cool and only or only cool a little bit and they form stars, okay, and then we allow this to keep uh, reaching a state of stability, and then once we reach a state of stability, then we somehow have life created on this particular planet, okay? Is that a good way to start a universe, okay? No, <laughs> would be the answer. Because if you're going to depend on natural processes after you have that explosion, they'll never produce a universe. Okay? And this is the basic flaw of anything other than Genesis 1. Uh, because just the scientific fact of the second law of thermodynamics which is the law of entropy, that is that any system is going to go to increasing disorder, not order, okay? Increasing disorder. Now, it's called thermodynamics because it deals with heat. But heat, as you know, <clears throat> dissipates, okay? It will become cooler if it's placed, if a container of heat is placed in a certain location, if the outside environment is cooler, okay? But the tendency of an open system of heat is going to be to go to more entropy, that is, more um, of a state of non-order, random order, all right? So that's the problem with starting out with a Big Bang explosion is their own laws tell them that it's not going to form stars and planets and some organization where the planets go around the stars at the proper distance and at the proper size and then create atmospheres for living things. And it's just not going to happen, okay? There is no chemical process that we know of that goes in that direction. And so the whole idea that you can start from some simple 
molecular explosion into complex uh, formations of systems, star systems, and biological systems is just out of this world crazy. Okay? Um, so that's not the, the best way to do it. What is the best way to do it? The best way to do it is the way Genesis says. Okay? First, you start with the building block, the cornerstone, and that's the earth, okay? So you create the earth, as it says in Genesis 1, and you're going to put water around it, okay? Because you're eventually going to have water that's going to sit on that earth, okay? But you also want a big mass of water around it because you're going to take that water and you're going to put it at the edge of the universe, and you're going to need that water at the edge of the universe for two reasons. One is you're going to need it to act as a weight for the inertia of the universe as it rotates. Because it's going to be a big block of ice, circular ice, that is going to be used by the universe to rotate. And it's going to humidify the universe. Okay, So there's, those are just two things that's going to happen with that water. So we already see the reason why God is planning this the way he is. Because then on the second day, he creates the firmament. And what that is, the space, inner or outer space. And it's a substance. It's not empty space, as they might tell you in science. And the reason for that is very simple. Nothing cannot exist. Okay? If it's out there, that means it's a substance. You may not be able to see it, just like you can't see air in the room that you're in. You can't see it. You breathe it, but you can't see it. Same with space. It's even much smaller than the molecules of air that are in the, the room that you're in right now. Okay? And that space uh, is was used to push out the water, but also leave a little bit of water on the earth. Why? Well, because we anticipate that the plants are going to be coming along in the next day, the third day, okay? So we have that little water, that's what our oceans, lakes, and rivers are, and that's what's used by God to water the plants that he's going to make, the trees and everything on the third day, okay? And the light that he created on the first day, what was that used for? That was used to melt the ice that was the big ball of water around the earth. Remember it says, the earth was void, and there was darkness upon the face of the deep. Well, the deep there is, is the water, okay? And that's, it, because there is no light, that means it has to be ice. There's no heat, all right? So it's a big block of ice, billions of billions of miles in diameter, okay? And the, the light comes, and it's a humongous light. I mean, it's just, you know, out of this world, large. And that goes all the way around the sphere of the ice, and it melts the ice. And that's why God is able to then take the water, leave a little bit on Earth on the second day, and make the rest of it go out into space at the rim of the universe. Okay, So there's a reason for the light, uh, for it, because of, it's going to melt the ice and so that we can now divide the water. And now, since the firmament is expanding, as the Bible tells us, okay, and taking the water, it also takes the light with it, okay, and there's just enough light on the third day that we can have, you know, evening and morning, and we can have the plants survive under this light, because now this humongous light, which was very close before, is now very far away, okay, and God needs to take it away, because we can't have this big light here anymore, we can only have it for, you know, just a little while to do its job. And that's why on the fourth day, God makes the sun and the stars. As a matter of fact, our fathers told us that God made the stars and the sun from that original light. As it went out into, into outer space, he took some of that light and put a star here, put a star there, and then put our sun where it's supposed to be. Okay. And so the, now we have all the reason why there's two lights. See, this is what confounds so many of the Catholics who read the scriptures and scientists. Well, why would there be two lights? And so the, what they try to do is say that the light of the first day was actually the sun, but the Genesis writer didn't, you know, he got his chronology wrong, so to speak, and, you know, put the 
uh, sun on the fourth day, but it was really on the first day. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? As if these guys don't know what they're doing. These writers that are inspired by the Holy Spirit don't know what they're doing, you see. That's what they're trying to tell us. No. The Holy Spirit knew what he was doing, and he needed two lights. One at the beginning, and then when it did its job, it was gone and turned into the smaller lights, the stars and the sun. Why? Well, because now um, you don't need a big, humongous light. You just need a little sunlight to uh, warm the small earth because it has no more water around it, no more ice, and it, it warms up this earth enough to give the plants photosynthesis, keep the temperature, you know, above freezing and not above boiling point, so to speak, uh, somewhere in between there in a comfortable range. And all you got to do is make the sun a certain size, keep it a certain distance, which is what God did, okay? Because that's all the light he needed now on the fourth day because all the other jobs were done, you see. So that's the way you make a universe, okay? Step by step, and you start with the foundation, the cornerstone, which is the earth in the middle, okay? And everything else is built around the earth, all right? As opposed to the idea that science is, modern science is trying to give us today, that the stars and the galaxies came first, and then the earth came eight billion years later. No, that's not the way it happened. As a matter of fact, that can't even work. And they've proved that to us because they have to keep inventing all these fudge factors in order to patch up all the mistakes that have been discovered. You know, whether it's inflation, dark matter, dark energy, uh, various speeds of light, because they told us that light and gravity can only travel so fast, and yet now they have an expanding universe going faster than the speed of light. You know, they don't know whether they're coming or going, these people, okay? And that's because there's only one way that a universe can be built, and that's the way Genesis told us, where you have to have divine intrusion in order to put all these massive objects in order, and that divine intrusion has to come in six days, six 24-hour days. That's the only way it's going to work, and that's the way God made it work, okay? Now, there are um, um, other ways that I can go into, and I will do that next time. So, Jordan, next time, bring the same question back because I'm not done yet, all right? But it is uh, four after eight, so I do have to run. Anyway, it's uh, been nice being with you guys today, and I hope that you'll come back tomorrow at 7 o'clock. And feel free to prepare your questions for then. Some from 7 to 8 tomorrow, Wednesday, that would be September the 18th, okay? So it's been nice being with you, and we'll see you tomorrow.